Hi folks, I'm Evan Tice. Um, thrilled to be uh, here today um, and talking to you about captions in Altspace and beyond. Um, just to give you a brief overview, I'm going to give you an introduction of myself and my background and um, how I came to uh, work on captions. Um, I'm going to introduce myself two ways. We'll get to that. Uh, we're going to talk about captions in Altspace. And I'm going to do this both from a feature overview, like talking about what we built, and then I'm going to teach you all the code um, and show you how easy it is to, uh, to make caption software for yourself. I'm only half joking. Uh, we won't go too deeply into code. Um, at the end, uh, I'm happy to take questions and uh, discuss captions and accessibility in general. One thing I will note, uh, I am not a Microsoft sp sp spokesperson, and I'm super thankful for Microsoft's support in giving me this talk, but I won't be announcing anything today. So just a heads up on that. And with that, I will introduce myself. So um, I learned to program on a Radio Shack TRS-80, which is very old even for the time. I went to high school in Montana, and I studied computer science at Dartmouth, uh, graduating in 2009. I finished college in the middle of the recession and was very, very happy to get a job at Microsoft. Um, I started my career uh, fighting hackers working on Windows. Uh, I worked a bit on bolstering security of the Windows heap. If anyone knows what that is, send me some, uh, some, some emojis or hearts right now. Um, being none. Yes, I'm a super nerd. Uh, the Windows heap is the thing that gives applications memory, and it's a frequent target of hackers. I also worked a bit on a dynamic defect detection tool, uh, which is a nerdy way of saying I worked on a program that finds security and reliability bugs in other programs. Uh, I'll pause and mention here that mixed reality was not an obvious career move for me, uh, but I eventually decided that I wanted to build things and not break things. And breaking things is a lot of what security engineering is all about. And I'll save my story about joining the mixed reality team for the end of this talk. It's a good way to conclude. But I made the leap uh, to a secret project in 2014, which turned out to be HoloLens. Um, I worked on persistence for HoloLens. So that's if you put an object on the wall, say Netflix on the wall, or if you put a model, an engineering model on a table, and you come back the next day, that model or that Netflix screen should be in the same place in your house or in your office in spite of any changes in lighting. Maybe you've moved a small amount of furniture around. That was my contribution to HoloLens V1. And right after that, oh goodness, I forgot to advance the slides. Um, right after that, I, I worked on articulated hands for HoloLens V2. And this is where my journey into accessibility in XR really began. So uh, can I get a show of emojis from anyone that's ever used a HoloLens V1? A handful of you. That's great. Um, the, the input and interaction model for HoloLens V1 was state of the art at the time. It was called gaze gesture voice. It basically meant you pointed your head at the thing you wanted to click at and you made this awkward clicking gesture on the screen. And um, in HoloLens V2, this was my feature, uh, we added articulated hand support. As the technology evolved over time, uh, we could do individual joint tracking, and you could do much more natural intera interactions. You could reach out and grab an object and manipulate it with your hands. Uh, in this um, slide, the, the user is actually interacting from afar. You can do that as well. But it was a much more natural um, progression. Um, after that, uh, I, actually, I should uh, uh, mention that all throughout this time, uh, I was on loan to the Altspace team occasionally and periodically. Um, I'm responsible for most of the Unity upgrades that the Altspace team has done. Apologies, content creators. I know you hate those. Um, and on one of those times when I was on loan to the Altspace team doing the Unity 2019 port, um, I did captions as a bit of a side project. Um, we'll talk more about captions in just a second. Um, I joined the team full time in November of 2020, and that's me and my journey to Altspace um, 
in a nutshell. But I want to introduce myself another way and talk to you a bit about how I experience XR. Um, I'm admittedly not particularly neurodiverse. I wear glasses, and uh, they drive me freaking crazy. I'm wearing contacts now. My boss actually messaged me on Teams. He's like, I've never seen you without glasses. Uh, and I'm like, well, I'm giving this talk, and I want to be able to wave my hands around, so it would be nice if I wore one of these fancy headsets I have through work, um, but I don't want to scratch my glasses. Um, and aside from my vision issues, I probably experience XR in a way that isn't particularly remarkable. Why am I telling you all this? And why am I giving this talk about accessibility in XR? Um, the obvious answer is I'm obviously part of the team that built the captions implementation in Altspace VR. Uh, I'm super proud of that. And we're going to get into the nitty gritty of how this feature works. Um, I'm sure I'll hear your feedback on how it could be better. Um, but more than that, um, I'm in a soapbox for a second. And um, jokes on you, Thomas and company, thank you so much for inviting me. But it's very likely I will learn more for this talk, uh, from, this, from this talk, from, from the discussion that follows this talk, than you learn from me. I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here. Um, I tried, um, I titled this talk Captions and Beyond because we are going to talk about captions. We're going to talk about some cool cognitive services that make apps more immersive and accessible. And I have a handful of small ideas uh, on that topic, on the beyond topic in particular. Uh, but I'm really looking forward to the conversation at the end of this talk. This audience uh, is likely more experienced and well-versed in accessibility and is likely to help me learn things. Uh, and I think that will make me a better engineer. And I think that will make the products I work on more accessible. So thanks again, Meryl and Thomas, for having me. Um, let's see. Uh, one other thing before we dig into captions. I went to the Kai conference in Montreal in 2018, and I think it's the thing that lit the interest in accessibility, um, set it off for me. I'm just going to play this video. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a short video, uh, but it was, it's, it was personally inspiring for me. And I will say before I saw uh, this talk and some of the others that were presented at Kai this year, I hadn't really thought about pushing the boundaries of accessibility in XR. And I want to credit the, the authors of this, uh, this paper and this research uh, for their inspiration. Uh, I think they set the bar high. I think we have a long way to go. And we'll talk more about that throughout this talk, if I can play this video. We created a novel VR experience by using haptic and audio feedback to enable people with visual impairments to experience the virtual world. Our novel haptic controller simulates the interaction of a white cane to help people who are blind understand and navigate a virtual space using their existing orientation and mobility skills. I found the domes at the traffic light. I found the pole with the traffic light button. All right, that's it. Uh, so Kai 2018. Um, I, 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 I said a few slides ago, and I'll say again, I, I am not the um, accessibility expert. I happen to build this really cool feature, and I'm happy to talk about it, and I'm super psyched to learn from you and see where we go uh, beyond that. So let's talk briefly about Altspace, uh, particularly for those of you not in Altspace out on the live stream. You're missing out. Come join us if you'd like. Uh, Allspace is a social VR application primarily designed for events. Events can mean everything from a virtual Burning Man uh, to an LGBTQ meetup, educators in VR, uh, or a holoportation concert. Um, aside, uh, Haley Gregg is giving a concert in Allspace tomorrow at 7 p.m. Pacific. Um, attend if you can. Holoportation is really cool. And if you can't attend, we also demoed Holoportation at our Ignite conference in March. Uh, we had holograms of James Cameron along with a giant squid. Uh, you can find videos of that on the internet. Um, Allspace is a great piece of technology to bring people together, uh, even when we're social distancing. Thanks, COVID. Um, we shipped captions during the uh, captions preview. We shipped it during the pandemic. And I'm really proud of this because we can bring folks together across language barriers. 
Um, we can allow folks who have difficulty speaking and hearing to participate in alt space. And we did so at a time that um, these interactions were sorely lacking in our personal lives for most of us because of pandemic and lockdown. Um, yeah. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of this feature that we built. Let's, let's, uh, let's talk a bit about it. So um, we have live captions uh, powered by uh, Microsoft Azure. Um, my speech is being sent to Azure and being sent back uh, to all of you as text. And we'll talk about how specifically that works. Um, captions in AltSpace can be enabled in select events. You'll notice if you ask a question later on in this event or if you were talking prior to the event, um, that in order for you to speak in this space, either via audio or text input, you must accept the captions consent prompt uh, because this space is caption enabled. And you can stay muted if you want. Uh, captions are lazily initialized. That means if none of you had shown up for this event today and I was in here and talking alone to myself, um, the, the captions feature wouldn't turn on. It's, it's waiting around for an audience member uh, who wants to see captions uh, before we actually light up the captions feature. Uh, that's, that's just a basic uh, cost mitigation. Um, captions are currently translated into eight languages. English, uh, German, Spanish, French, Italian, Japanese, Korean, and Portuguese. We present captions in two different ways. Uh, there's the presenter captions that you're looking at right now. Those can be viewed from afar. They have my name on them. Um, there are initial take at a uh, more traditional speaker style uh, or presentation style closed captioning. And then there's also the speech bubble, the social um, captions feature um, that, uh, that, that you'll have uh, when we, uh, we finish up this event and everyone's mingling around and talking amongst themselves. There's a speech bubble that's attached to the player's head, um, and you can read it. For some, it's easier to read than others, admittedly so, but that's our social caption um, viewing mode. And there's um, rudimentary, rudimentary text input on PC. We'll talk more about this in a second. I have a slide or two on it. Uh, and there's also the option uh, to speak and view captions in different languages. So that's the feature uh, as a whole. And I'm realizing as I'm looking at my slide now that I actually have in the picture, I have a picture of the social captions. Those are those speech bubbles I was talking about. All right, rudimentary text input. Um, I have to press enter to enable this, and I got a little uh, box that shows up uh, in, into which I've typed hello captions. And when I hit enter or click send, on the uh, audience member side, uh, we have a perspective of a Spanish caption viewer in the audience. And whereas I typed uh, hello captions, they, say, or they see hola subtitulos. Um, this feature is admittedly limited. It's only available on 2D PC right now. And due to a weird quirk I won't delve into too much, it still requires you to unmute your microphone in order to type. Um, the other captions feature I want to talk about is our settings. Um, I, I mentioned earlier that you can view and speak in different languages. Um, that's not the default. You have to fl flip that little slider that says view captions in another language. And when that appears, you get a second language selection, in this case, set to German. You can also adjust the size of the, uh, the caption text box. All right. Uh, here's an architecture diagram. And Laurel told me my slides are impossible to see, so I'm going to describe this for you. Um, client 1 uh, sends audio data to the Microsoft speech service in Azure. Um, and the speech service sends back captions text. Uh, we're going to deep dive into the speech SDK in just a moment, but it's the area of this diagram in green. After the client gets the caption text back, it sends it to our back end where it is sent out to other players. That's the current implementation. And um, let's deep dive into that, uh, that green caption or uh, speech SDK part. So the Cognitive Services platform is a comprehensive set of Microsoft technologies and services that's aimed to accelerate incorporation of speech into applications, as well as to amplify like 
the, the, the impact of those applications. Uh, this is a set of technology that wasn't necessarily developed with virtual reality or augmented reality XR in mind, uh, but I think it has a lot more to offer us than we're using it for today. Again, the title of my talk, Captions and Beyond. So this, this software stack was, uh, typic is typically used for scenarios like call centers. Um, call centers really like transcription and translation. Um, also, uh, more recently, voice assistants. No one wants to touch an elevator during COVID. Wouldn't it be great to say, take me to the fifth floor? Uh, we use two of the core capabilities of the Azure Speech SDK. Um, we use speech to text and speech translation. And we'll dig into each of those in a moment. Yes, I promise I will teach you to code. Uh, it won't be too painful. But the platform enables us as applications developers to do a lot more. Um, I am really impressed as I was researching my talk and the capabilities of, of the uh, Azure Speech Service, um, particularly in the areas of custom keyword creation. You can create a keyword like Hey Cortana that lights up the speech service and starts listening. And they also support things like custom commands. That's like run the vacuum or open the menu, that sort of stuff. Um, I'm super impressed with this speech text technology, and I'd like to demo you some of the features we're not using in AltSpace. Oh, um, well, that's so, quite a change from California to no, Utah. No, don't play. Heavy snow. Don't play yet. Didn't get the other video to start when I uh, hit the slide, um, but this one did. Uh, this is the voice gallery within Speech Studio. You can play around with this at speech.microsoft.com without writing any code. One of the things that particularly struck me uh, is how the affect of voices can be adjusted. Um, these things sound more human-like over time. Um, I'm going to play two clips for you, one conversational, and one is the voice of a newscaster. So this is tech, uh, text to speech in two different styles, uh, first conversational and then a newscaster. Oh, well, that's quite a change from California to Utah. Heavy snow and strong winds hammered parts of the central U.S. on Thursday. And those are just the built-in ones. Um, if you're so inclined, you can build your own custom or neural voices and make them even more expressive and emotive. So lots of untapped potential in the uh, speech SDK. All right. Who's ready to learn to code? Actually, uh, one or two more slides. Um, there is um, several processes at play in speech translation. Uh, one is capturing... Um, and conversion of the speech into text, and the other is the translation of that text into the desired language. Uh, in the caption and conversion stage, so this is um, the part where the application captures audio, sends it to Azure. We run automatic speech recognition in Azure, and it performs an initial conversion. Um, that initial conversion is just words without context, um, and that, that initial conversion, that automatic speech recognition is refined using true text. Um, true text uses uh, text matching patterns. Microsoft Research has a few papers on true text, but to su suffice it to say that the transcript is refined over time. This true text stage is where we might um, correct uh, or, or, or disambiguate between two words. Think H-E-R-E uh, -E here versus H-E-A-R here. Um, can you hear me? Um, the true text is where we, we imply our learnings about language um, and, and, and further refine that recognition. Uh, in the translation stage, so now we've got text, it's been refined. The text is routed to another machine learning model that's been trained with uh, up to 60 languages, and we get partial and final translations. Uh, we'll talk more about these partial translations in a moment. Um, if an application is using it, uh, the text-to-speech system can also convert the translated text back into speech audio, like we demoed um, a few slides ago. And obviously, Alt, um, Altspace isn't doing this uh, today. All right, now comes the code. So um, I'm going to give an example of uh, transcription without translation, but we'll add translation in a few si slides. And my goal in the code is less important here. The annotations I put on the code are, are, are more important. My goal here is to convince you all that adding captions uh, is really relatively straightforward. So the first thing you do 
um, is you 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 take in some sort of speech configuration. Um, this includes the input language setting that the language or that the speaker is speaking. In my case, United States English, um, as well as a credential from wh whomever is paying the bill. And then two lines of code initialize a speech recognizer from an audio source. An audio source could be um, a microphone, a sound file, some other source. And then we wait around for a single phrase to be recognized. And in this demo, we print it out to the console. We'll talk about continuously recognizing a phrase and multiple phrases in just a moment. But first, let's define a phrase. I gave that example, um, can you hear me? Uh, I carried it over here as well. You can think of a phrase similar to a sentence, but in reality, it might be multiple sentences. Um, if you're noticing, sometimes my uh, captions overflow off the screen. Um, that's generally because Altspace itself doesn't really understand sentences. It understands phrases from the speech SDK. Um, as the phrase builds up, the true text technology refines the estimate that it's getting um, using its understanding of human language. Um, so in this example here, we get four updates before the phrase is finalized. Can, can you, can you hear, spelled incorrectly, uh, and can you hear me? And on the Altspace side, when we're getting this text back to save bandwidth, uh, and because some of these phrases can get quite lengthy, and because we're doing this in multiple languages, we try to only send the difference between the previous phrase and the current phrase. So that was, that's what that right column is about. OK, more code. Um, if we want to speak more than one phrase, we can wire up some callbacks. Our previous demo wasn't that useful because it just uh, could only recognize a single phrase. So as the user speaks, um, the recognizing callback fires repeatedly. And when the phrase is done, the recognized callback fires. And there's also callbacks for the session being canceled or stopped that can also fire. OK, um, translation doesn't change much. We create a translation configuration with credentials and settings, much like we did just for simple English transcription. And we specify a source language. Uh, for nerds in the audience, this is the BCP47, <laughs> uh, which is a standard for identifying human languages. You can look it up on w Wikipedia. Uh, but the important thing to note is that for the speaker, we include a region. A US English speaker uh, might get better text recognition out of a US English model versus the UK English model. And that's why we do that for the speaker. And then for translation languages, we specify eight in Altspace. I named them off earlier. And for these, we simply denote the language. Uh, the text a reader in Britain is looking at uh, and the text a reader uh, in the United States um, is looking at, that's going to be the same for both of them. And if you're playing around with your settings um, and you turned on that view captions in another language, you'll notice that there are many, many, many more options um, differentiating different types of English and Spanish and whatnot uh, for the speaker and not for the viewer. And that's why that, that is. Um, so yeah, we create an audio source and a recognizer the same way that um, we did before. And the um, the the events that we looked at, those recognizing and recognized events, the canceled events, they fire just like they did for pure English translation. The only difference um, for the nerds in the audience, uh, we get a dictionary back as opposed to just, just a string. So we have this mapping between um, the language code and the actual text in that language. All right. Um, it's going to be hard to see. I apologize. Um, I downloaded this sample from the Microsoft Speech SDK uh, samples on GitHub. Um, this is very, very similar to the code I just showed you and the code that we have in Altspace. Um, but I want you to pay attention to something if you can see it. And if not, I will blow it up for you. Uh, pay attention to the, to the phrase changing over time. Here we go. The captain has turned on the seatbelt sign in preparation for our descent into the Seattle area. I'll play it again. Did you catch the uh, change? The captain has turned on the seatbelt sign in preparation for our descent into the Seattle area. OK, so about halfway through um, that recognition, it ended a sentence and it started a new one. Um, the captain has turned on the seatbelt, period. Sign in is the 
first part of that second um that second sentence this is all one phrase by the way so it's a little weird it didn't maybe it didn't have confidence that the phrase was actually ended but as i kept speaking and as it got more context um and and ran through these models that have been trained um it figured it out the captain has turned on the seatbelt sign in preparation for our descent into the Seattle area. Um, I'm not looking in VR to see if it captioned it as I said it correctly, but you get the idea. I'll play it one more time. The captain has turned on the seatbelt sign in preparation for our descent into the Seattle area. Yeah. Uh, I'd encourage everyone to who who uh, does have uh, some engineering skills or interests or wants to learn, uh, take what I've taught you today. You're now coding experts. Go download the Cognitive Services Speech SDK, and um, you can uh, you too can experience captions. Um, that's just about hey, it. Evan, quick question on that last part. Yeah. Um, Thomas here. So, is the um, for the continuous recognition? Is that a different API? API call, or is that just the default that it does that kind of? Um, can, like, can you repeat the question that? once more? Um, it's for the continuous recognition, or where it does the recognition kind of after it's processed more of the text, is that on by default, or are those different API calls for like? Yeah, it's a different API call. There was okay. the like, okay. um, I forget what it was called, but it was the one I showed originally. It's that that's just like capture a single phrase um but it's it's a related api call where you can wire up the recognizer and the recognizing um okay. it's 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 a sibling to that api if you will okay thanks yeah okay um i have some ideas about what could make xr more accessible um from readability to support for more language uh to improve text input for those unable to speak um, but I, I want to leave you all with a thought. Um, and I want to spend the portion of our QA, um, Q and A talking about the future. Um, before we do that, I want to look back to the past. Uh, when I joined the HoloLens team in 2004, we were just a code, code name project. It was actually interesting. It felt like, uh, for those of you that have seen the movie Matrix, the, the Matrix, it felt very much like the uh, take the red pill or take the blue pill and see how far the rabbit hole, uh, hole goes, uh, that quote from the Matrix. They didn't really tell me I'd be working on HoloLens. I had an idea that the, the project was, was going to be awesome. Um, and around that time when I was interviewing with this team and trying to decide, uh, do I really want to leave security, the hiring manager um, described what we were doing in a way that really struck um, stuck with me. Um, he talked about uh, when the mouse became widely available in the 80s, and even into the 90s, uh, we didn't quite know how to write software for it. Uh, here's Microsoft Word 6.0. I had a blast installing this today in a VM. Uh, it was kind of a pain uh, to get it running again. Um, and I couldn't find later versions uh, of Word that had the menus within menus within menus. Uh, but I always remember like, um, using software as a kid, we had the mouse. We didn't really know how to build UI for it. Um, clicking, misclicking uh, out of a menu was a pain. Misclicking out of a nested menu was an even bigger pain. And we had the mouse, and we knew it was going to be amazing. But it took a while. Um, and um, similarly, for HoloLens, we had uh, this, this paradigm, this gaze, gesture, voice paradigm. It felt so amazing at the time. Uh, but it was nothing compared to articulated land, um, articulated hands, um, and I, I think about that often. That it that it took you know many years to design intuitive UI. Um, you can say what you want about the the ribbon in in Microsoft Word, but I find it much more um, um, accessible and and easy to understand and approachable uh, than searching for something in a menu. And and similarly, um, I think we've improved on gaze, gesture, voice. Uh, with what we've did um, uh, with articulated hands in HoloLens. And now so with accessibility in VR, I think we're really at the Word, um, at, at the Microsoft Word 6.0 stage and the gaze, gesture, voice stage today. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing your ideas for the future and having a discussion about what we build next. Um, but yeah, my, my, my big takeaway is, is, is 
we're, we're, we're at the uh, we're the vanguard of, of of something new and exciting here. Um, I want to acknowledge some folks before I open up for questions. Um, Meryl and Thomas, thank you so much for having me. Uh, Jolie, for your help with the stream. Uh, Laurel, uh, for jumping in and helping uh, moderate at the last minute. I want to really think, thank the team that built a captions prototype for a hackathon that ultimately evolved into what we have in Altspace uh, today. Uh, that's a project for, or that's a probably a talk for another day. Um, the Altspace team, I see a lot of you in the audience right now. Um, um, thank you for attending, and thank you so much for helping me troubleshoot random caption and projection issues the last few days. I'm really excited about what we build next. I love working with you. You inspire me every single day. I want to thank the Azure Speech team uh, for your help on building captions as well as on this talk. And last, uh, but certainly not least, I want to thank each of you for attending. And uh, with that, I'm super happy to open it up for a discussion. And I'm going to put my headset on properly because it's starting to hurt and look at all of your beautiful faces. <laughs> Great, and hello everyone. This is Thomas again from Ali VR. We're going to take a couple questions from the YouTube stream first um, because we do have people that aren't with us here um, in the world. We're going to ask their questions, and we'll take your questions here. And then, um, if you are also here on the stream, please uh, continue typing questions. We're excited to get a lot of questions. And thank you so much to Evan tonight. I I thought this was like very inspiring talk, and I really appreciated. You were showing concrete code examples and we can um, try out. Yeah. So first comment for you, just, this is just more of a comment, but um, Makoto Uekisan may be in here, but he was using the Japanese translation feature tonight uh, for your presentation or him in the morning in Tokyo, and he said the uh, translation was working very well in Japanese. Uh, Makoto, are you in the room? If so, um, your comment directly I'm not seeing oh i would love to call on on <laughs> on someone who who is speaking one of our eight languages uh that i don't speak and 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 um have everyone be able to see that that'd be cool okay well makoto if you are here give us an emoji and we'll pull you up um to show that off but that i thought that was a great comment and happy to hear that um second we have a question for you from uh, deb myers on the YouTube stream, how is the speech SDK with people who have speech impairments, such as stuttering, thick accents, et cetera? Um, I would encourage you to try it and let me know. Um, my guess is improving over time. Um, you know, we, I, think, I think we as an industry have realized that when we train machine learning algorithms, if we only train them with people who look like us or sound like us, they're only going to work well for 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 people like the, who look and sound like us. Um, so try it. Let us know if it's not great. Send us the feedback, and uh, it, it it gets better over time. Cool. And I'm trying to flex some recent knowledge, from Evan and Laurel, on using the host panel here in Alt Space tonight. But I have just turned on the raise hand feed and my host tools. And if you would like to um, ask a question or a comment, uh, if you will do the hand raise, and then I will call on you. So first person calling on is Laurel. Hello. I have a bunch of questions, but I'll keep it, keep them specific and scattered. Um, first of all, you talked about some of the training. One of the problems that we have from the very beginning is that alt space comes out as old spice and variations thereof. Um, is work being done to, to, you know, in the training process for those things better for brand names and Old Spice? <laughs> uh, that's a really hilarious bug. Um, <laughs> one thing I'll say, so um, we don't send Alt Space data for the purposes of training right now. Um, we We would... We would consider doing that, but we'd probably have to allow users to opt in. Though I'm not surprised to hear that the name of our product uh, maybe isn't transcribed correctly. I will look into that. Someone should shoot me a bug or, or a feedback. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think it's altvr.com support. 
and uh, I, I, yeah, I will look into that because that's we've, funny. We've sent it in. We've sent it in. And then um, really quick, I want to talk. Um, could you talk about the two way translation? Um, because I think that's going to be the biggest, biggest game changer is that I can speak in my language and it's translated into theirs and they can speak in their language and it's translated into mine. Um, it's actually eight way translation. Um, at any given moment, so you and you can you can test this out right now by just going into the settings panel and changing your language preference. Um, the the words I'm speaking in English are being sent to all of you in eight different languages. Um, the two way feature I think you're talking about is the ability to view uh, captions in a different language. Um, that's just a choice we made in the UI. Um, because I think it would be really hard to perhaps see your uh, see your speech in you know more than two languages, or you know, to see it in more than one language. Um, but yeah, I I I envision folks being able to use that. Maybe they're trying to learn a new language. Um, maybe they're proficient in uh, a language, or maybe they're not proficient in a language. Maybe they're talking in 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 English, but uh, they're more comfortable speaking in German, and they want to see how they're they're their their uh, speech is being is being translated. Um, it's it's probably not the most common use case. I'll I'll, I'll admit during this talk, I've kept my uh, captions on English the entire time. But um, there are those that you suspect will get value out of it. Did I answer your question? Yes, you did. And I see in all space when it's ready to grow up and come and join us with the captions um, because I cannot wait for that moment of having that choice to of a language set upon installation so that people who come into all space they land in the info zone or the campfire wherever else can immediately have answers to their questions and they can immediately connect with people that are around them in their language not just it we don't speak italian don't can't help you know the problems we've had yep. supporting that i love this thank you I hear you. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. And I'm going to take a couple more questions from YouTube. But for those of you all here in the room with us in all space, please use the raise hand feature. And we will uh, be calling on you next after we handle a few more on YouTube. Uh, so Evan, we have a question from Wendy Danels. Do you know what the word error rate is for your project? I don't. I have no idea. <laughs> I will say um, I spent a lot of time developing this feature, reading the Gettysburg Address, uh, just over and over and over again, uh, mm -hmm. and and tuning how captions appear and you know when we break and when we don't, uh, or when when we break up uh, phrases and when we don't. Um, I found that uh, with certain types of text, it seems to work better than others. Uh, Laurel just mentioned the name of our product is not uh, always uh, properly <laughs> transcribed. Um, I, I've, I've noticed with other words, um, you know, in mixed reality, we're sort of a niche. Uh, we're not, as I said, the primary use case for translation. And some of our um, technical jargon and, um, and phrases doesn't translate as well as the Gettysburg Address. But I have no idea about the error rate. Okay. Thank you. Next question from Jocelyn Gonzalez. How has Altspace managed to add all these deep speech models without creating lag? Doesn't it make the app significantly larger? Uh, it does not. Um, I think, don't quote me on this. Actually, I, sh I probably shouldn't say that. Um, I was, was going to say, um, I think the fonts themselves for the languages that we we display, particularly um, like the Korean language um, and some of the other Asian languages, um, th those files are very, very, very large. But the actual models don't live on your device. They live in Azure. Um, so we don't um, we, we, we need we need the binaries that know how to interact with the Azure service, and we need the um, and we need the fonts, uh, the, 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 the character atlases. Um, that's the bulk of the file size. And then all of the compute happens in the cloud. Great. Thank you. 
All right. Uh, last question we'll take from YouTube, and then we'll come back to YouTube, and we'll do some more questions here in all space. But um, last one from YouTube for right now, uh, from Sima Space. Do you have Why not? I, I lost uh, your audio cut out until oh, the end of the question. Um, do you have any deaf people on your team? If not, why not? We, on my immediate team, uh, I do not have any deaf folks. Uh, we do have colleagues within Microsoft and our broader organization that are deaf. And why not? I would love to have more deaf folks on our team. And uh, yeah, careers.microsoft.com. <laughs> Tag uh, <Yeah>. Space VR. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right, I'm going to go back now. Uh, Chris Turner, I'm going to turn on your on air and megaphone. I think that'll put your microphone on. So if Thank you'd you. like to ask Thank your you question. very much. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. And it's great that you guys are doing this. My hat's off to you. Um, and I like the idea around beyond because, I, you know, when we think about the many different types of disabilities from vision. Um, uh, hearing, um, motor dexterity, cognition, mental health, speech. There, there's lots of opportunities. A few that I was wondering about is, um, you know, maybe if someone had a reading disability or something, the ability to click on a, a button and actually speak a message or speak maybe a menu uh, or an event menu or something like that. Um, and I have many other suggestions and ideas um, around different disabilities. I was wondering if there's a place where we could submit some of our ideas um, so that they could get to you guys for a review. Please do submit a ticket on altvr.com. OK. Not all VR. Yeah, standard ticket, alt, then. Alt VR, yeah. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, ch I'll, ch I'll check tomorrow because I keep telling people to, to put things in there, and uh, I'll, I'll collect any feedback that's submitted. All right. Yeah, I took a class recently from Hector Mento. He's on the accessibility team at Microsoft and really opened my eyes. The class is called Digital Accessibility for the Modern Workplace. It's on LinkedIn Learning. And, you know, there's really a lot of things we need to think about when we're creating content, whether in the workplace or outside of the workplace, and, um, and how that content might be interpreted by those that have, you know, different preferences or different needs. Um, and we, I think we all need to build towards that so that we're inclusive. Yes, absolutely. Thank you again. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Sure. All right. Next, we've got Kurt, uh, VR Dude 18. I'm going to um, give you the megaphone. Hello. Hopefully you can hear Hi. me. Yes, Hi. Can. Um, yeah. Um, so are you going to have text to speech in old space in the future where people can come in and through 2d or whatever do a, a translation for people that can't love, speak and whatnot i would love to have text to speech i can't make any okay. product announcements today okay um the other thing was i'd like to see it um in world where we, if we put a pop messages in our worlds that a pop-up message could be translated to that local language for that person coming in that has a setting for a different language. I mean, nice to Thank have a translation. Back. Yep. Okay. Great. Please do submit a ticket. All of all of these ideas. I can't. I can't. All right. And uh, next, we're going to call yeah, on. No problem. <laughs> uh, we're going to call on Makoto Ueki, who will be speaking Japanese and using the language feature here. Live in the room. So let me turn on Makoto. <laughs> may need Laurel or Evan's help with this. Um, I'm not sure. It doesn't look like I'm able to enable that. Uh, there we go. Why can't I do it? <laughs> oh, because they're not in the room. Yes, I just, they just okay. left. <laughs> Sorry. All right, well, Laurel, thank you. Next question. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we're all clicking it. Um, 
during when you had your videos, the videos was were not being captioned in alt space. So it wasn't working. And is there because it's 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 tied to our microphones, right? How do we take that next step other than to caption all of our videos manually or or bring in cap you know somehow captioned in in the web project or whatever? How do we pick up those sounds that are not truly mic based for oh, captions? Brilliant question. That is an absolutely awesome question. I mean, we clearly have the technology to send audio off to be captioned. <laughs> uh, just in a different place than, than the web projector um, stack. Send me that uh, as a bug as well. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> I'm excited to see that. I'll, I'll plus one that if I can plus one that. Um, all right, uh, Makoto-san, here we go. I think you're live. さん、こんにちは。おはようございます。聞こえますか私は今日の東京にいます。そして日本語を話しています。皆さんの画面で私の日本語が英語に翻訳されているかどうか、あるいはさんのご自分の言語に翻訳されているかどうか、ぜひこ
the most it's like such an exciting feature and it's something that we've never seen and it's, it's really exciting to see it in this environment and um yeah that was awesome so echo that thank you uh fleet you, admin gram nine seven five three should be unmuted now yeah um so i was wondering if you could talk about like some of the technical challenges for me i've i've used this with some people before who have um who were very comfortable with two or three languages and they found they've told me that it's been uh, a little bit hard for them to use sometimes because uh in order for it to properly translate like, like let's say from french to english you have to s stay locked into speaking french and and, and uh they're more used to when it comes to talking to someone who's uh monolingual kind of jumping between the two languages is that possible to allow for or is there some technical challenge that that makes it so you have to stick uh to one language and speak it very fluently and clearly for it to be translated i am not a um azure uh or, or even much of a machine learning expert but i can guarantee you that we've heard this feedback before and i'm sure the folks in the uh Speech SDK team have heard this as well. I would imagine that training a larger model that is capable of doing um, like cross language um, would be more difficult, require more compute. But um, if we've learned anything, and if my the spirit of my talk is um, really like we need to keep pushing boundaries. So I, I'm with you. I'd love to live in a world where. Um, I mean, you saw the slide. We have to tell the speech SDK uh, today what language we're speaking. Um, who knows uh, what uh, speech recognition technology a year, five, ten years from now will will do? I'm not privy to, to any of the speech SDK team's uh, plans, but I'm I'm sure they've heard that feedback as well. And All right, you and mentioned me. technical oh. challenges. Um, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I can <laughs> comment on that. Uh, going into this, I knew nothing about font atlases, so that was an interesting learning journey. Uh, doing those in Unity uh, was challenging. Um, I don't think I'm an expert by any stretch of the imagination, but we pulled it off. Um, the other thing that was challenging, uh, strangely, was bandwidth. Um, and you don't think about it for text, but these large phrases over time um, in eight languages, um, it can it can it can build up, and um, if you play around with this feature when you're not megaphoned, one of the things you'll notice is that when you walk further and further away from a user, and their speech bubble suddenly disappears or eventually disappears, and uh, you stop hearing them, you'll also stop um, seeing their captions. And in fact, around the time we we the we we stop sending the audio, we also stop sending the caption data. That was challenging as well, but um, kind of a fun problem. Cool. Um, and Evan, I'm going to take a moment just to steal a quick question about. Um, I was curious for like the SDK calls that you were showing. Um, is there any kind of plugin or adapter for like Zoom, or if someone wanted to get similar functionality, how hard is it to use the SDK? Like, is there any kind of helper functions or would, would you, if you wanted to, for example, use this with Zoom, need to write um, your own code? I have never written a Zoom plugin. Does anyone uh -huh. know how extensible Zoom is or what their SDK looks like? Um, we can leave that as a rhetorical question. <laughs> I'm going to tilt my headset back up and go back to the Cognitive Services um, website I have open in another tab. And I will, in a, just a moment, I can read off the language projections that they have. Uh, but it's more than just C Sharp and Unity. Uh, let's see. Azure Speech SDA. 
Uh, maybe while I search for that, we should take another. Uh... Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, here we go. Let me put in some oh, C yeah. sharp, C plus plus, Go, JavaScript, Objective C, and Swift, and Python. Uh, and that's just from docs.microsoft.com. <laughs> But awesome. yeah, they, they, they have language projections and engine projections for, 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 for quite a few things. So I don't, I don't know about Zoom specifically, but okay. um, getting started in Unity C Sharp was certainly not hard. Awesome. Thank you. And we will also be posting links to um, you know, resources you highlighted in your talk on our, our Meetup page at meetup.com slash AliVR, and we'll be doing recaps um, on our awesome. blog at Equal Entry. I'm um, going to read a few more things here from YouTube. Uh, we have from Patrick Donnelly, appreciation. I love how the live translation gives an appreciation for syntactic differences between languages. And then a question, which might be another secret one, but from Leon Guo, question, any plans for Chinese translation? Uh, would love to do Chinese translation. Can't can't make any product announcements today. Wish I could. Um, I'm, I'm going to give a shout out back to uh, Patrick. Patrick is actually my my husband and uh, studies uh, speech and hearing and the reading brain. So appreciate that feedback as well. I don't know that he's actually nice. seen this feature ever before. So thanks for oh. thanks for joining, Patrick. That's cool. All right, um, from Jolie McPhee, our um, uh, Internet Society of New York. Dreamer he says captions was a beta feature. Is it now? Uh, we're still calling it a beta. Mm. Oh, sorry, your audio cut out. I didn't mean to step on you. We're still calling it a beta. You might have noticed that it's appearing in more events than it used to, and that's a good thing. And I hope that continues. Um, one, one. For those of you that are on Mac, you've probably realized that captions uh, is not working. Um, I'd be hesitant to remove the beta label until we're, you know, at parity across all of our all of our platforms. Well, and then we have a comment, which um, I believe they can send to your support link, but switching captions from large to small and vice versa did nothing for someone's um, someone's had that feedback. Um, is there any extra guidance on how they submit feedback or that Please issue. file a ticket on altvr.com slash support. Uh, I, I will personally uh, make sure that our feedback gets collated. I'll, I'll probably look tomorrow morning. Cool. Right, I don't, um, I don't want to call for... I don't want to call her out, but somewhere in the audience, uh, one of my coworkers <laughs> who's also passionate about ex ex accessibility is hanging out. Actually, I see a bunch of coworkers. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Um, yeah. Good. Yay. All right. Um, I'm going to take uh, two more questions here um, on YouTube, and we're getting close to the end here for our stream. But obviously, uh, as long as anyone's available to hang out in the space afterwards, it's fine. Um, we have a question still on the YouTube stream from Miles DeBastian. I heard that Allspace was going to support hand tracking, such as Facebook, Oculus Quest. Can you comment as to this because it would allow deaf people like myself to converse in our native sign language? I have also heard that um, folks are using VR chat to sign. Um, hmm. So un understand the ask. I, I, I wish I could uh, agree to implement all of these features and you know roll them out tomorrow. Uh, party line is I can't talk about um, anything um, in development at the moment, but I do hear you. Um, I'd love to be able to do it. So, um, all right, and then uh, from Becca Evans, she said, thank you for your response. Feature is incredible. I was lucky to have it enabled by special request for an Allspace event, and everyone was amazed. Wonderful way to practice learning languages. Yeah, I actually. So thank you for that. Um, the the view captions in another language. Uh, we actually thought uh, learning a language might be a, a primary scenario for that feature. So I'm I'm, I'm glad you're using Allspace to learn. Uh, I'm guessing you're probably using that. Uh, view in a second language feature. Thanks for trying it out. 
and thanks for the feedback.